When you think of someone who could make it really big on social media, you usually think of someone that's handsome, really beautiful, has some kind of charm to their character. They have specific features that make them unique and special or influential because after all, the label is an influencer. While we may not love them, they are the biggest assets in capitalism, politics, and political agendas at large. One interesting fact is that when surveying young Gen Zers, it was found that 50% of the total survey population wanted to be an influencer when compared to other occupations like astronauts and doctors. So while we can all point to the people that we hate on the internet, the reality is, is that they're probably not going anywhere. The influencer era is sort of here to stay. Of course, there is an extremely large difference between good influencers and really poor influencers. The good ones carry the internet like an atlas carrying the world. Wait, does someone give some subs? Ah, oh, bro, you didn't have to. Can I, um, give that money back? You can watch the stuff for free. Like, that's the best thing you can do. Use it on your family, not me. Uh. And the bad ones, well, they just seep out of the excess in the internet and really invade the utility that we all use it for by spilling into what we do. How that results in zero subs? There are regulars here. Five dollars a month! How are you have hours of time to watch me and not five dollars? Who we are going to discuss today might just be some of that bad stuff that seeped out of the utilities that we use the internet for and has now become mainstream in some capacity. Shannon Malik might just be the next worst influencer. He's a man that is chronically tired, almost sloth-like in his speech, and he's only 22 years old. We're not going to snuff it. We're going to drink it. Oh, look at this. Fucking plastic straws. Fuck time. I fucking hate paper straws, bro. All the New Zealanders watching this will understand. You go to Macca's, but by the time you drive home, your fucking thing is already, it's already limp. <laughs> he manages to be nearly a claimed 300 pounds at this age as well, which is extremely impressive for someone who is so young to be that kind of size with majoritively muscle mass. But I do have to say that there is no shape or form that he is lean. He is definitely a little bit on the fatter side and likely a lot of that weight can be comprised of fat mass, but a still really impressive physique for a guy his age. He also jokes a lot about claiming natural, and he, for a second, he almost had me. I almost thought he was actually claiming natural, but I actually did my research. Unlike Greg Doucette, who did think that he was natural and made a whole video claiming that uh, he was a natural. So he was doing a natty or not on him. And what's funny is in that video, he actually started to think that he might have been natural when he very apparently is not, and he talks about it a lot. He's mentioned on hundreds of YouTube videos, his use of trend and other things, as well as Instagram and TikTok. But how many times have you watched me seeing videos that I did 42 shows while being 100% natural? I was a lot smaller, but I was in fact a natural athlete. And when you see these photos, the next one I'm going to show you, you're not going to believe it. I am natural in both of these photos. Let's examine this exhibit A from Derek's video. See on the left, you know, it's a, uh, you know, grainier shot in terms of like image quality. Um, black and white. And so look at these two photos. Photo on the left, photo on the right. Clearly, I look enhanced in both. Right? Wrong. I'm a hundred percent natural. A series of things that he does do, which I'm going to talk about here as a depiction of his character, which I find quite shocking, is, for example, using Zins while working out. And not just one Zin, but two. And for those of you who don't know what Zins are, they are a nicotine product that you put into your mouth, much like a chew, as we call them in America. Except it's not actually tobacco, it's just pure nicotine. And I gotta tell you, there's nothing like a young influencer promoting drug use whilst also already being on a copious amount of drugs such as anabolic steroids some really great stuff really great stuff he's also religiously on trend something that i have talked about many times before and how horrible it can be and people say that in the comments he's joking but i actually would err on the side of him not joking and probably telling the truth here the reason i say this is it could be a big part of why his speech is so much slower and this is not a joke trend even as an environmental toxin meaning it comes from byproducts 
in terms of cattle or livestock that's using trend to enhance growth mechanisms contributes to the development of cognitive diseases, degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, like dementia, and many more, and especially at very early ages. I'm not talking into your 60s, I'm talking about it in your 30s. Trembolone has a really interesting and almost evil effect of easily crossing the blood-brain barrier, which people say, well, all drugs do this, and that's actually not true at all, especially when it relates to androgens. But in specific, what Trenbolone will do is bind to the androgen receptor near the hippocampus. Once it's there, it notably causes apoptosis, which means the death of cells. And having neurons die is really bad, because unlike other cells in our body, they don't regenerate. While testosterone can be very neuroprotective if used correctly, Trenbolone has even shown to render testosterone positive neuroprotective effects completely inert, creating many long-term issues within cognitive functions such as long-term planning, really irrational behaviors, which we've all seen on the internet and probably in person too, as well as an assortment of really bad speech patterns. We actually see this in people who use THC religiously as well, which this is also something that Shane is very fond of. So to make matters worse, yes, he does other recreational drugs. He doesn't just do the whole Zin thing. He doesn't just do anabolic steroids, but he does smoking in terms of actual cigarettes. He smokes weed. He drinks frequently, which he's quite proud of. This is what we're looking like right now. We'll check back in in like six weeks because I'm gonna be taking some stuff. <laughs> but. <laughs> the, 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 this is what I'm looking like. Wait, it skipped to like 10 minutes ago when you were like saying that like steroids are what? Steroids are for cheaters and. Yeah, except for me. When I take it, it doesn't count. <gasps> oh! Oh! <laughs> Oh, what the fuck, man? <laughs> man. Yo. Not hey. like us. We, um, we just finished the workout. We're just finishing each other off. Uh, we were just finishing the workout. And uh, what are we going to do now, man? <laughs> going to get some food. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, all of these things have been shown time and time again to drastically really corrupt cognitive function, long-term and short-term. Uh, alcohol is arguably the most neurotoxic thing you can do acutely or for a chronic habit as well. It's it's not good any way you put it. Keep in mind, this is only the tip if we're going in balls deep here. I don't very much understand the intention behind Shane posting content. I suppose it's to make money and people like it, so therefore he continues to do it as he's encouraged to do it. However, However, I struggle with a simple question myself, and that is, what is the purpose of this content? If he was deleted tomorrow from existence, would people really miss his content, or would they just find the next person that's fulfilling the same scheme on their algorithm as they're swiping through TikTok? It's a serious question, and I don't really mean to be rude by asking. I just find that the encouragement of zins, cigarettes, steroids, booze, and weed to be something that isn't positive, quote unquote, for society at large, nor a younger demographic. So before we go any further, let's rewind a little bit and kind of construct an image of what Shane looks like or what his past looks like in creating the figure he is today. His childhood wasn't easy. It seems like there was a little bit of tumultuous times around his youth. And this is a very common trend we see within the fitness community and at large with a lot of people who abuse anabolic steroids, including myself. His childhood was less than ideal. He lived with only his mom, and it seems like the father was out of the picture. And he lived on islands near New Zealand in which they did not speak English, and so he had actually never learned English until he moved to New Zealand, which is where he resides now with his mom. Having to learn English with this other fragmented language that he had in his capacity definitely would present some issues, especially when integrating into schools, which are primarily speaking in English. I say this because it's interesting to note that when someone has a difficult past, and I assure you, while I'm not highlight all of the details because I simply don't have them, there is probably a lot more that we don't know as he's probably not willing to talk about it. But even if it wasn't necessarily traumatic, just not so easy compared to a person to your left or right, it could very well be the roots into where his current situation is now and with how he's doing now. And I say this as well as a person who's gone through it and I've told you guys many times about my past and how truly awful it was and the things that I had gone through. In going through that past and going 
you know, through the adoption process and several things like this, I've met many other young individuals who were also in a very traumatic situation with their parents or in childhood generally. And I found that usually people take one of two paths. The one path is they take their trauma and they use it to sort of gravitate themselves towards success, hard work, and really good ethics. I've also seen another path that people take, which is the second one. The latter is not necessarily so great, which is that they use their trauma to justify bad behaviors, to do reoccurring things that aren't necessarily conducive to a healthy, wealthy, and successful life. And more often than not, with a traumatic past, even slightly so, we see people head down that other path to a direction that isn't so favorable for society or themselves. What is interesting about Shane, though, is there's these moments where you kind of realize that he might see the things he's doing as bad. He speaks a lot about his nicotine addictions and how he wishes he never would have started nicotine in the first place, advising the audience to never even touch it, as he himself is so addicted he can't stop, and it's a regretful decision that he made. He also does another interesting thing that I don't think many influencers do, which he does admit that he is on gear and sometimes will even explain what compounds he's on, but he never explains the doses of exactly what he's taking and he's always very vague when addressing the issue. This could be an act to protect people from following his specific protocol, which I think is highly mature of him to think about. You see this with a lot of people, Chris Bumstead being one of them, he's never really came out and said exactly what he's running for his cycle, nor do we see this with the likes of Sam Selleck. None of these people speak on what they're taking or how much of what they're taking. They usually just speak on that they are taking something for performance enhancing drugs, which I can admire. However, I don't know if it's exactly a good thing because it does leave people to their own imaginations as to what those people could actually be taking to get their results. But in reality, it's probably not that much. And a lot of these people are genetically gifted to such a degree that allows them to be super successful. And thus the imagination of those young onlookers are definitely expanding in terms of what this person is taking is probably extremely radical, therefore I need to as well take something that is just as radical. He also speaks on his friends from high school and how when he stopped drinking and partying as much and got into the fitness lifestyle that he really found they separated from him and no one wanted to talk to him anymore. In fact, it was easier for people to talk to him when he was only drinking and hanging out with the wrong kind of people. And when he started doing the right things and making more money, that's when people actually stopped reaching out to him and wanting to actually hang out. Something I think most of us can relate heavily with. You often find that when someone starts to prioritize themselves as opposed to the friend group or that person at large and that person's own interest or that group's own interest, that those people in group usually get mad or distance themselves from you. Even if what you're doing isn't directly to besmirch what they are or what they stand for, but rather you're just taking your own path to be healthier, happier, wealthier, which I think is honestly some old clunky evolutionary trait that we developed when we were tribal human beings. If you really think about it, it's sort of like this tribe doesn't do what this tribe does. And so when this character in the tribe starts acting a different way that might be opposing to what that tribe's norm is, they start to kick them out so that they have to go join the other tribe or just be completely isolated at large as a safety mechanism. And I think truly that this is just some clunky mechanism that's been left around in our society for some time. And to me, all of these things sound like a person who doesn't have destructive intent, or at least someone who doesn't intentionally have destructive intent. And maybe that the reality of the situation could be that they're being influenced by other people to do negative things for clout or attention. Lastly, one of the things that I think is quite obvious is that money is a big motivator for Shane. He was once sponsored by Gorilla Mind Supplements, a company not just owned by Derek More Plates More Dates, who likely you are all familiar with, but a company that is also owned by Christopher Deutis. Gorilla Mind is a really interesting company because it has a peculiar taste for people who do really experimental things with pharmaceutical as well as publicize a lot of what they're doing with pharmaceuticals, which in the future, I'm going to make a video breaking down this whole company and some of the things that are underneath what we get to see on the front end. And he said, while admittedly enjoying Gorilla Mind and having better products than most competitors and specifically enjoying the people who work there, that they didn't pay him enough and that making more money was far greater of importance to him than to stay with the company that he preferred. While I can understand the drive to make more money and how important that can really be for some 
someone's life, I also really do realize the morals and ethics behind certain decisions that a person can make. And through those morals and ethics, you sort of develop a reputation or a resume that other people can externally view. And your ethics might be put on a judging scale when compared to the next opportunity that you might have. So it's a dangerous thing to really play the game of, well, I just want to take the easiest path with the least resistance to the most money and just in the wayside burn the bridges with everyone else. This usually, as in the easier path of making more money, doesn't work the best for the audience because they get the short end of the stick. You start promoting products that you don't necessarily believe in just to make a bigger check. And it's also not good for your career in terms of the outlook of longevity with other companies that might have even greater opportunities than, say, just commissions or something like this. And because I've watched probably way too much of this guy's content, I've noticed that he's now sponsored by Huge Supplements, which is another pretty good supplement brand, except he's only ever mentioned them once that I can count in a video. And even on his Instagram, there isn't any mention in his bio or the link tree or anything. If I was a supplement company and I sponsored someone and they didn't even put me in their bio on Instagram, in their Twitter, in, in their YouTube videos and anything, I would have some pretty big problems and there would be immediate reevaluations going on with both that person's value in the company and also the people who decided to take him on as an influencer and provide him with a paid contract. But let's move on to his actual physique. Now, me considering his health as a coach who helps a lot of people get as big as possible but remain as healthy as possible, I am a bit concerned. He is too fat, and I mean this in the nicest of ways. And I don't say this to embellish my thoughts or to really make you think that I'm trying to be rude and, to be honest, a bit contentious. I say this because it is the reality of the situation. We have to speak facts and we can't stray away from it just because someone's feelings might get hurt involved. When you are running several drugs, both recreational and steroidal in capacity, you are burning the candle fast, especially at both ends. But when you're doing both of these things in concert with having too much fat mass, you now start putting a lighter in the middle of the candle that you're burning at both ends. It's melting super fast. What people fail to realize about fat mass is that yes, it is a percentage, but there is a lot more to the story, especially as your body weight scales with muscle mass. My friend here explains it really well. I believe that fat gain in the face and head is actually one of the main causes of fat head. Now, how can this be, you might be wondering, when the bodybuilders with fat head have such low body fat percentages? Well, I'll begin by noting the incontrovertible logical axiom that at any given body fat percentage, the more you weigh, the more fat mass you'll have by definition. I can illustrate this with an example. So let's compare two men. We'll call them Tim and Ben. They're of the same height, 178 centimeters, 5'10". That's my height. Okay, so Tim and Ben are both at 10% body fat. But Tim has an athletic build and weighs 70 kilos, whereas Ben is an enormous, juiced-up IFBB Pro bodybuilder in his off-season who weighs 140 kilos. Now, despite Tim and Ben having the exact same body fat percentage, Ben has twice as much total fat mass as Tim, since he's double Tim's weight. So whereas Tim has 7 kilos of total fat mass, because that's 10% of 70 kilos, his body weight, Ben has 14 kilos of total fat mass, because that's 10% of 140 kilos. Now, because Ben is so incredibly jacked, he won't appear that fat, at least from the neck down, despite having a relatively high amount of total fat mass. And that's because Ben's 14 kilos of total fat mass are distributed across his hulking frame of 126 kilos of lean body mass. However, there are some areas on your body where the amount of muscle you can gain is relatively limited. Those areas include the hands, the feet, and yes, the face and head. So you could expect Ben's hands, feet, and head to be disproportionately fat relative to the rest of his body, since those are all areas where you can't gain much muscle mass to, as it were, spread out the fat mass across a greater surface area. Conversely, you could expect Tim to have a much leaner head and face than Ben's, despite them both having the same body fat percentage of 10%. So that's what I see as a major potential explanation of fat head or why these huge bodybuilders can have veins and striations in their bodies, but fat rolls at the backs of their heads and double chins. And I think this aspect of fat head has, and only will continue, to become more pronounced over time 
as the bodybuilders keep growing. Another thing is, it's also been observed that the top bodybuilders of today simply aren't as ripped as they used to be with their new fixation on playing the so-called size game. We're late Conditioning 90s. is not the same. Look at those guys. I mean, nobody looks like they've been on a diet, like a real diet diet. But if I'm to be honest, and that's, that's pretty much normally what I am, I feel the standard of the Mr. Olympia uh, is not what it used to be. If that's true, then coupled with my theory, we have a good reason to believe that facial fat mass largely explains fathead. Just because you have more muscle and you may look leaner at times, doesn't mean you're actually lean. If I'm 300 pounds and I have 15% body fat, my 15% body fat is double that of the amount of fat a 150 pound person would have at 15% body fat. And the amount of fat cells you have is what is going to dictate the amount of adipokines you produce, which are all inflammatory molecules, some good, but at a certain extent, of course, just with anything, the more you have, the worse they can get is not correct. It causes a lot of inflammation. Through that inflammation, you develop other mechanisms like insulin resistance, chronic heart disease, and various other things that you really don't want as a person who's trying to leverage a healthy lifestyle. And this is why I say bulking in infinity is a terrible idea. You should bulk, but with a smaller surplus than you probably imagine that you would actually need. Your goal should be to gain 0.5% of your total body weight per week. Even then, you should be starting at a very very lean position when you do decide to mass. But people would like to argue the fact that being somewhat fat is a necessity to gaining muscle. And then, you know, eventually when they have to lose the fat, they realize that, oh, I didn't actually build any more muscle. I just was really fat and it made me look bigger. Cool. So if we were to combine all of the drugs that he's taking, both recreational and steroidal, which I guess they're both kind of recreational, and possibly like a pre-existing genetic health issue that he had never checked, you are asking for a really quick path to a cardiovascular event that would lead to his death or at least, I mean, probably at best, a severe impairment of his day-to-day -day life. If he were to go on to an aggressive cut, I would imagine that Shannon would have an amazing physique that would probably get lots of interactions on social media and all for it, he would be much healthier. Not to mention, at the end of that cut, he could likely take less anabolics and get far more results, again, further protecting his health. I've spoken about this many times, but if you don't get really lean before running a cycle, you're really shooting yourself in the leg. You might as well get very, very lean before you start and then start your cycle. Please watch my first cycle video on this because I go into detail here. And this is if you do a first cycle, which I clearly do not recommend. And while he has some muscle and a lot of fat mass, his lifts are also clearly destructive as you can get, throwing weight around as if it's just trying to get to the end point, not really trying to use his muscle. Literally, most of his movements are 80% momentum and 20% actual employing his muscle tissue. Again, this has me actually questioning his ability to gain muscle because it could be far greater than what we're seeing if he's making this much progress with this little effort. Imagine if he actually applied some really great effort. Imagine he started preaching, doing less drugs, doing more really appropriate training and eating a balanced and whole food-based diet without all the cigarettes and weed and stuff. If he started preaching that, having the physique of a lifestyle that would include that, I imagine he would actually be able to leverage a larger audience such as Chris Bumstead. To conclude, this isn't a problem necessarily, but what is the problem is audience that he is preaching these things to. You see, his audience isn't 30 year olds looking to build muscle. His audience is 20 years old or younger. If you look at his tagged photos on Instagram, this becomes extremely clear. A lot of the people on his tagged photos are probably around 15 to 16 years old. Not a lot of them look much past 18. Posting about his unfiltered lifestyle can definitely be relatable and somewhat enjoyable enjoyable as we tend to put people on a pedestal who aren't doing so great for themselves. Think about Logan Paul or really anyone that we follow whose life is kind of a shambled mess. But few people in that audience, I assure you, consider it as motivation and consider it as an endpoint for their goals. So there's going to be a large minority that pick up on these trends and start to replicate them for themselves. This is the sort of behavior that influencers partake in, in which I call boomfluencing, a term I use to define people who are slowly and 
literally killing themselves, but making a living off of doing so by interactions from people on the internet. All the while, acting none the wiser that they're doing all of these things just for the enjoyment of other people's viewing potential and making a little money, sure, but in the long term, really ruining their lives. And again, meanwhile, as all of this is happening, influencing other people to do just the same. If you like this video, consider giving me a like, comment down below, and if you can, please subscribe. It does really help me and makes this channel way more efficacious for me to spend tons of time in, and it means the world to me. And you probably will never know how much it truly means, but hopefully I can tell you enough to where you can start to understand that if you already are a subscriber, I value you tremendously. And if you are thinking about subscribing and you actually do, you are one of my newest friends.